All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 12th day of June, Sunday morning in the year of our Lord, 2022. I'd like to talk about the Southern Baptist Convention, which begins today. I looked at the agenda. It's thoroughly scripted, like everything is at the Southern Baptists. Uh, Southern Baptists and, well, Rick Warren, the uh, consummate Southern Baptist have a lot in common. Everything is thoroughly carnal, thoroughly scripted. It's humanistic, man-centered. They believe in the power of man. They believe in planting churches, not preaching the gospel. Their entire uh, domestic missionary organization, the Home Mission Board, is about planting churches, Southern Baptist churches. There's nothing more carnal than going out of your way to plant uh, denominational churches without regard to what churches are already in a place. It's not whether there are solid Bible-believing, even Baptist churches, you know, like independent Baptist churches. There's, there's some good ones out there. No, we don't care about that. It's got to be a Southern Baptist church, even if it's not the South. See, Southern Baptists dominate Southern United States. There was a, a, a split back uh, years ago that had to do with the creation of the Southern Baptist Convention. The, the Baptists, uh, the, uh, you could say the American Baptists, but not the current American Baptists, had a disagreement back in the uh, early uh, first half of the, before the, the Civil War. The, uh, the, the Baptists in the South complained that they were being neglected. Uh, the the uh, push in the missionary was the, there was a mission Baptist missionary convention. There was no such thing as a Baptist denomination. That's a, that's an abhorrent idea to to Baptists because Baptists are local churches, congregational, not necessarily congregational government, but generally are. Uh, they believe in the the autonomy of the local church under Christ not autonomous from God, except uh, Southern Baptists are autonomous from God. <laughs> and many, many independent Baptists are too. They they don't take the will of God into account. I, I would say from my experience as a pastor, yeah, uh, churches tend to be more concerned with their own interests than the interests of God, uh, which is a bad thing. Not that they don't have legitimate concerns. As, as God says to Christians in general, you know, do not be, uh, take into, into account the concerns of others, not just merely your own concerns. And it's not, you have to martyr yourself uh, for others. Of course, evangelicalism is a history of that. You know, the idea that everyone has to be out pounding on doors and everything else, preaching the gospel several times a week, you know, like Jehovah's Witnesses, <laughs> except they don't have the gospel. Well, yeah. Uh, fundamentalist Baptist churches historically have had, like, Sunday morning or Saturday morning visitation where they get go out and present the Roman road and try to get people to say a prayer with them. And then they count it up, you know, put a, a notch in their uh, gun handle, so to speak. Oh, uh, there's another one for Christ. And no, it's not, not unless they're really born again. And most of those people never show up in church and certainly are never baptized, and even that doesn't make you born again. Uh, living a consistent Christian life, more or less consistent Christian life, is the real evidence of that you've been born again. A change in attitude towards sin, away from sin and toward God, and then seeking to live a life consistent with the will of God, uh, with all the faults and everything else that go along with that. But it's not... 
we don't approve of the faults. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, the Southern Baptist, anyway, the, the, uh, the they were complaining about the mission. The, this was a missionary, extra church missionary outfit, which in itself is unbiblical. Prior to this, there had already been a controversy in America uh, among Baptists between what came to be known as a primitive or the non-missionary Baptists versus the missionary Baptists. In fact, there's a denomination known as missionary Baptists, at least one, probably several out there. It wasn't about sending missionaries. It was about whether an organization outside the church should be sending missionaries. And the anti-missionary Baptists, which was like uh, the, the anti-abortion, it's a slur in itself, were not opposed to missionaries. They just thought that the local churches had to send them, which is what independent Baptists do today. Although the other churches will assist with the missionary. Uh, but uh, they are sent by a local church and accountable to that church. Now, <clears throat> the, the, they, the, the, what was developing was ex, extra church organizations, uh, uh, pseudo-Christian organizations, what do they call it, uh, uh, those kind of things, uh, parachurch organizations, just alongside the church, but not under the direction of the church. That was the objection of the so-called anti-missionary Baptists, or today known as primitive Baptists, and independent Baptists, and others, was that this, has no, this is not biblical. It's not, it's not biblical that the local churches that sent the missionaries, not some organization that exists outside the church. And the uh, at one point the Southern Baptist the Southern Baptist churches were complaining because this this missionary society was focusing their attention on the Midwest, which was the Western frontier at that time, uh, putting the most of the resources there, and neglecting the South the southern churches and their areas, their concerns. Uh, and then the issue of slavery came up where uh, the southerners wanted to send a particular Baptist uh, as a, a missionary who happened to own a slave, and the northerners said, no, you can't because he's got a slave. You can't, he can't take a slave with him. So those two issues, all carnal, created the southern Baptists. And then the other churches in the North became the Northern Baptists, which renamed themselves as the American Baptists, which are thoroughly mush today. But so are the Southern Baptists. But the Northern Baptists are even more mushy. <laughs> so uh, the uh, denomination of the Southern Baptists was, was birthed in carnality, the love of money, and uh, the, the, the idea of taking a slave with you. Uh, <clears throat> Say, now, if independent churches had sent their own people, none of this would have been an issue. See, that the controversy over missionary Baptists versus non-missionary Baptists, the non-missionary Baptists are on the Bible side of it. Not that they don't have missionaries. That's just uh, Orwellian language, calling themselves missionary Baptist church. What they really mean is we believe in missionary societies outside the church which is what the Southern Baptists are. Because the Southern Conve Baptist Convention is nothing but a missionary society that has grown into a leviathan of uh, several heads. You've got the, 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 the seminaries and universities, the printing head, uh, the political action and lobbying group, the ERLC, and a bunch of other things, and the executive committee of this missionary conglomeration uh, is always trying to accumulate more and more power to themselves. Well, why does this happen? Why do churches uh, subject themselves to such unbiblical? The idea that you're, you're in a, of a name, a denomination, is contrary to the clear teachings of the New Testament. 
even the churches that claim to be non-denominational, like the Churches of Christ, well, they're very sure that the sign on front of them says Church of Christ, or sometimes Christian Church. But they're, they make more about the name on the building than most denominational churches do. So they are really hyper-denominational while claiming to be non-denominational. I'm talking about the traditional church, conservative, uh, non-instrumental, especially, especially Churches of Christ, but not only the non-instrumental. I'm fairly familiar with them. There's a lot of them around this area here. Uh, in fact, a church I was pastor in was uh, connected with the Restoration Movement, even though it wasn't the, the Campbellite wing of it. They were part of the Stoneite wing, which were like the uh, charismatic wing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, talk about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, they... Uh, so re the, rejecting all language is not biblical, even biblically correct doctrines is like really childish childish thing there's one i think he's still around local pastor here that's in a traditional instrumental church of christ who refuses to talk about john the baptist he always refers to him as john the immerser john the immerser even though the Baptist is a transliteration of the, the Greek word baptizo. Uh, one who immerses, but or, immerse in, or washes, uh, it's, it's used of something uh, to under the water, but it, it doesn't, uh, it's not sprinkling. It's, they have a different word for that. <laughs> but it's, it's not the issue when you make Mountains out of molehills, you're in the wrong church. So anyway, back to the Southern Baptists. Well, that's that's their origin. Uh, they were generally Calvinistic. Uh, and it was for a while, a long time, there was competition between the Baptists before the Southern Baptists, really, and the Methodists, because those both of them were very evangelical, preaching a lot on the frontier. The Anglicans just, or the uh, Episcopal Church, the American Anglicans. Uh, well, they weren't interested. <laughs> they were comfortable. When Christians get comfortable, it's bad. Anyway, that's where they, the Southern Baptists started. And why would you join? And, and then it became more and more denominational-like although it's not tech, it's like the Churches of Christ. They're not technically a denomination, even though they have a convention and headquarters and stuff like that. It's, supposedly, the convention has no authority over the local churches, except for peer pressure. You know, there's pressure. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of it, Southern Baptists. They use their domestic missionaries as, well, enforcers. There has been reports of that. Not that independent Baptists don't do things like that, too. They do. They blackball. They blackball. So you, you, if you want to have the uh, be on good terms with the rest, you have to go with the flow, and that's usually big ones. Yeah, there's a problem there. Now, uh, what I want to talk about really isn't this, but I want, I'll get into it in a minute. This is not how God does things. Uh, I believe that, like, a churches I've been pastored in, or it's pastored, we're generally smaller churches. The reason, I, I believe, although nobody would actually say this, but they came really close to us, uh, it's clear that the reason they want to be part of a denomination is out of fear. They don't trust God to take care of them. They want the power of numbers. They, feel, they want the security of being part of a denomination rather than trust God for their local, to take care of their local assembly. They, they want the, the so-called benefits of the denomination that really is just a leech that draws its life off the local churches. It's a, it's a you know, um, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Not a predator, uh, an, an animal that lives by leeching off others. Oh, a lawyer. <laughs> Uh, not all lawyers. 
I don't, well, maybe. Uh, no, but the uh, a parasite, yeah, uh, that's, that's what they are. The uh, denominational organizations are really parasitic organizations. Now, if they want to go do their own thing as a parachurch organization, just don't try to live off local churches. Just try to raise individual contributions. Still not good because there's no there's no biblical authority and God's not going to bless it. But, you know, people are more concerned about whether they can get the approval of others and they are the approval of God. And that's that's pretty clear. And you find that everywhere, just everywhere. <sighs> Humanity, even Christians, we, we so find it so easy to walk in the flesh instead of walking by faith, which is the same as walking in the spirit. Hmm. And of course, you also have to have a born again congregation, which is seldom the case. Uh, um, uh, the majority of Christians need to be born again. I mean, you can have a couple in there that really aren't, but if you have a majority of unregenerate people, your church is unregenerate. It's going to follow the flesh because that's all it has. It cannot walk in the Spirit because it doesn't possess the Spirit of God. Especially when you got a congregational church, which is... Uh, the idea of a congregational church is, is not a democracy. It's the idea that God will express, the Holy Spirit will express his will through the body, the, the, the congregation of born-again believers as they seek God's will. We find that in Acts manifested, uh, even though you, in the case of uh, whether the Gentiles, the first council of the church, or the Gentiles need to be circumcised or not. There was a debate, discussion, got acrimonious. Uh, Peter had his testimony. And then James, who was sort of a leader of the, the other side, stood up and said, well, my judgment is that we do this. And there's a lot of Christians that think that means that, that James was the head of the church. That's foolishness. They don't understand anything. No, James was just rendering his opinion, and he was sort of the leader of the faction that was pro-Mosaic law. That, uh, that thought that they should be circumcised. So God chose James to solve the problem, and James said and said, you know, I think Peter's right. I think God doesn't want us to put a burden on the Gentiles because of what the Scripture says. The Holy Spirit convinced James and the, uh, the, the opposition leader, the one that wanted to circumcise them, apparently, or the, the faction that he was sort of leading, uh, the, the, uh, the Pharisees, the, the Christian Pharisees that were pro-circumcision. And uh, because James said, uh, you know, I think we should, the Holy Spirit says, no, we should just leave them alone <laughs> and just give the, render a few things that's necessary for the unity of the body of all. And then the, 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 the congregation as a whole, the apostles and the saints, recognize that this was the will of the Spirit of God. They, they recognize the Spirit of the God bore witness into them, this is the will of God, and said, yeah. So it was the Holy Spirit that rendered the decision. And then they communicated that by sending several witnesses and a letter in writing <laughs> so they would know what had happened. And... Uh, that's how it works. That's how congregational church is supposed to work. Do they actually work that way? No, no, no. What happens are that you have influential people that want their way, deacons and elders, things like that, that usually large donors <laughs> become those people. Money. And it's interesting, the letter of James specifically condemns the idea that people that are wealthy and major donors to a church should be given particular honors as deacons and elders because they're wealthy. Yeah, he condemns that as carnal, sinful. But that's standard practice among Baptists and I'm sure others too. <laughs> Simply the way of the flesh. But the, the idea of desiring uh, safety in numbers 
is not biblical. Just like democracy, the majority rules. That's unbiblical. That's ungodly. That's wickedness. That's contrary to the explicit commandment of Scripture, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. So it doesn't matter what law they pass, what opinion society has about things that God has spoken about. When it's evil, you're not to follow them. You're not to participate with them. They don't have the right to legislate evil. And saints have a duty to God not to obey those kind of things which is a good reason to follow the instructions of Scripture. And uh, Paul says, desire to live, to work with your hands and live a quiet life. Yeah. Uh, the reason, you know, to be in, um, independent and uh, not seeking to be a big shot in the world. A tradesman would be a good example, like Paul was, a tent maker. So young people, young men, young women, but particularly men, endeavor to learn a trade and to uh, maybe apprentice yourself and go out and do something that actually does something, you know, makes things, uh, uh, and then uh, endeavor to move on to become even even your 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 own work for yourself or be part of a small business stay away from the big corporations that's my advice over years and and I've worked for big corporations and I've worked for small businesses and I'll say small businesses are always better because they're composed of people not corporations I mean, you, you can, you'll know the boss. It's a matter of personal relationships. If it's just bigger than that, if you can't talk to the boss, uh, you don't belong there. It's not good for you. And of course, if it's a, if it's a, you've got a, a hostile ast attitude toward Christianity, it's not a good place to be. It's not a good place to be. Don't try to convert people that don't want to be converted. The apostle, the, the, we've, the de example in the New Testament is when the gospel is spoken and people don't want to hear it, let them go. That's what the apostle did, the apostle Paul. He let them go. They didn't want to hear, fine. Then they gather those, and, those that, want, that heard the gospel and wanted to hear more. But leave the others alone. Those that don't want it, let them go. That's their choice and their fate. So uh, let's see here. Let's go on. Let's go to the scripture here. And where is the scripture? Oh, I had to restart the computer because, I don't know, anything that's done by uh, Microsoft, just flaky. I wouldn't use it if it wasn't for... Uh, now I've got to look up it again. Okay. I want to go back and look at Gideon. In regard to Southern Baptists uh, and other denominations, and the desire for numbers and power, Worldly numbers. That's, see, that's what the world is, about numbers, especially in the United States, democracy. It's about how many people you can get. Oh, it's about social media, too. In fact, I, I happen to notice I've got a video that is being processed. It takes YouTube all day to process something uh, that I just posted a little bit ago uh, on uh, Babylon the Great in America. But anyway, uh, I, I noticed I sort of did an experiment where I... Uh, closed my YouTube account and reopened a new one. I was still under thinking biblically, but... And that deleted all my uh, uh, subscribers and everything. And I wanted... It was sort of an experiment because I was getting suspicious that... And, and now there's a whole uh, uh, 
Elon Musk wants to uh, back out of the Twitter deal because he knows he found out that uh, most Twitter members are bots. They're phonies. They're fakes. And I was getting suspicious about uh, uh, my subscribers because I had got up to over a thousand. I noticed that you'd, you'd stay very low and all of a sudden you'd get quite a few and then it'd start going up steady and then it, it'd level off. And it lo leveled off like about a thousand and fifty. Just over the monetization thing. But I never tried to monetize a channel and I never tried to promote it. I figure if God leads you there, good. If not, I just happened to notice while I was uploading, I didn't look, and I happened to see 16 subscribers. 16 subscribers. I had over 1,000 for quite a while. I was doing basically the same stuff. So it all depends on what YouTube wants to promote and what YouTube doesn't want to promote and how many subscribers are actually real. Because I was getting responses that were canned. You get a comment on a video, and a comment from a particular YouTube member, it was always identical to the word. It's like maybe there's a canned response, you know, where you can just hit a button and that's it. But that raised suspicions. Are these real or is it just YouTube manipulating it's creators. It's uh, uh, content creators. And yet we know, do know that YouTube seriously ever, uh, works to commit to uh, manipulate content creators. But uh, social media in general is, general is very manipulative. It rewards you for producing content that is mindless drivel, just like Hollywood produces. It rewards useless content. But it punishes content that talks about the critical issues that we face today. Like talking about pandemics, or vaccinations, or politics, or the root causes of things. Reality, and gender, and sexuality. If you don't uh, support the party line, which is the party of Satan line, they punish you. It is built into the algorithm. Like I said, I had, I was doing it for years, and I had over a thousand subscribers, about a thousand fifty, and then it just stopped and flatlined. It's like something is weird. Yep, I'm also on Rumble, and Rumble seems to be different. And I'm not even trying to promote it. I don't even really understand how Rumble works much, but I they uh, I upload things there. It uploads things a lot faster and doesn't spend all day uh, trying to f run it through their algorithm to decide whether or not they like it. There are certain things I don't like a lot about Rumble, but uh, anyway. Strange. Isn't that strange? But back to the issue of Southern Baptists, and this is applicable to denominations in general, I would say, and even churches. The desire for numbers, strength in numbers. Judges chapter 6, starting at verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, that's like an oak tree, I believe, which was in Ophrah, and which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, who's, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Now, the Midianites was a neighboring country that liked to come by and steal the wheat, you know. Uh, Israel suffered these kind of things because of their own sinfulness. And then God would raise up a deliverer, a judge, as in the book of Judges, uh, to judge his people and deliver them from their enemies. But the Israel always, there was always this downward pressure, the downward pressure of sin in the flesh. It always pulls down. And God has to raise up and restore people. But he always, he, there's a 
uh, a cycle of 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 decline and then judgment and then deliverance, decline and judgment and deliverance. So God, they keep going down. God pulls them up and they go down. God pulls. Them. You'll find it in your own life sometimes. Uh, yeah. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O oh, you mighty man of valor. Here, what's he doing? He's hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat. Uh, Gideon said to him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Well, see, obviously Gideon's not a spiritual man, or he would have known that. This is a, a result of God's judgment. It's just like the the uh, the utter corruption in government in America, uh, the pandemic, uh, the everything that's happening and that's going on now. Now nothing good is happening in America. It's all see. This is just just the the natural uh, cycle of. God's, uh, as you sow, so shall ye reap, it just snowballs downhill. Uh, man's sin snowballs. It picks up and picks up momentum and just takes you down. It's just uh, the, the rec God's judgment of retribution on sin and the suppression of the knowledge of God and people turning away and just doing their own thing. It always brings disaster. And then and the disaster that God brings, God has that in order that you might understand this is bad and you need to turn back to God. And this is sort of a little irony here with the angel calling Gideon a, of course, this is prophetic, but a mighty man of valor when he's actually hiding in a wine press. Uh <clears throat> So why has all these things happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, uh, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? And But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. That's actually a good statement. God approves of things like this. Why has all this happened to us? And where is the Lord? And he'll tell you. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you will save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Sounds like Moses, doesn't it? So he said to him, O oh, oh, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, the tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. Well, so is David. Least. And Moses... Well, Moses was cast upon the waters. He was nothing. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. See, if God is with you, who can be against you? It is God. The power is in God, not in man. And if you don't know the story of Gideon, you you don't know that Gideon's a little bit slow on the uptake here. <sighs> so he said he immediately asked, well, then he, uh, he said to him, now if I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Okay, so he wanted a sign from God, and it was <laughs> a fleece. And then he did like the... Uh, the scientific test of it and reversed it and said, now let it be this way. Uh, uh, God had to uh, condescend to, uh, to prove his uh, self to Gideon. See, Gideon was not a great man of valor at that time, actually. So let, we're going to skip down to chapter 7. And it says here, Then Jeroboam, which is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped against the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites were on the north side of them and the, uh, by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, 
The people who are, now God was, again, he promised to deliver Israel from the Midianites. So this is when uh, the, the battle is going to come about. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, we find this theme all through the, the scriptures. Uh, and in the Old Testament, particularly, uh, God brings Israel up into impossible situation at the edge of the Red Sea uh, and uh, makes it impossible. Here's the armies of Pharaoh coming. It's God's showing that it's God who delivers, not themselves. They can't deliver themselves. It's only God. And every born-again Christian, you ought to know that. It's God who saved you. You didn't save yourself. You can't save yourself. It takes the power of God. Well, see, the Southern Baptists have rejected that. They think that you can just get people to do something. It's a program. They turn it all into a program. And it's all about numbers. How many, how many have we baptized this year? Not how many have, have you know, it's not, they don't have statistics on how many crimes Southern Baptists uh, commit. You know, how many of our people have been arrested? How many are imprisoned? How many of this and that? No, no, not that kind of statistics. That might give them a clue whether or not they're really getting people saved or not. They don't care. They just want you to be a member of a Southern Baptist church. That's all that matters. They're very carnal. They, don't, they cannot see the kingdom of heaven because they've been born again. That's obvious. I'm sure there's exceptions, but not a whole lot. <laughs> They're definitely not a majority of Southern Baptists that are born again. It's a terrible thing. But that's true in most congregations. Some congregations probably don't have any people that are born again. So God says, "There's you got too many people with you. I'm not, I'm not going to let Israel glory and say that they won this victory. No, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to make sure you know that I did it, that Israel knows that God did it. See, Gideon was all about signs anyway. Now, verse 3, Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from, the Mount, uh, from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 people, uh, and 22,000 of the people returned. And 10,000 remained. So, so two-thirds of Gideon's army walked away. Are you afraid? Go home. So God's left with 10,000. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you here. Then it will be that uh, whom, uh, I shall, I, whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, uh, the same shall go with you, and whoever I say to you, this one shall not go, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set him uh, set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who uh, gets down with his knees to drink. Now, some people make a big deal about the... Uh, the reason why God picked those that lapped rather than those who knelt to drink. Uh, I would not say that's the, th the point. The point is God wants a few. Most people would kneel down to drink. Those that lapped water like a dog would be few. Then God's purpose is not to get the ones that are that are a particular quali qualified by reason of their strength or manners or whatever, but those who are not. He wants few people, not lots. He wants to disqualify most of them. So he's got 10,000. How do I get rid of most of them? Then the, then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hands. 
Let all the other people go, every man to his place. So out of 10,000, God narrows it down to 300. Obviously, lapping water like a dog is not the usual human way of drinking water. God said, gives me the dogs. Yeah, uh, So, the, but the point is not how they drank. The point was narrowing it down so there was only a handful, only 300 people against the armies of Midian. Just like with David, who came uh, a couple centuries later than this, I believe. Uh, yeah. uh, one young man, uh, one uh, adolescent boy, God said, he's the one. And he had already been anointed king at the time, of course, secretly anointed, uh, by Samuel. So the, the Holy Spirit was abiding on David, who was the legitimate king of Israel. And nobody knew it except God and Samuel. And David, acting as God's deliverer, delivered Israel from, uh, what was the name of the, mon the, the giant? Anyway, and defeated, you know, the, the armies of Israel, King Saul and his armies, were cowering to hide, to find, uh, behind their defenses. And so God sends a boy, a shepherd boy. A young, you know, he's, he's old enough to watch the sheep. That's it. So God does that. It's not, it's not numbers. It's not about numbers. It's about God. It's about what God wants and what God empowers. It's about faith in God. If you've got faith in numbers, faith in programs, faith in systems, faith in institutions, you do, God will not use you. He will not bless you. Because he knows your flesh will say, I have done it. God will not allow the flesh to exalt itself. Or to be exalted. He says, no. And all these people that, that make heroes out of other Christians say, oh, look at this great man of God. You are committing idolatry. God doesn't bless that kind of stuff. It is God who does it. And when you think it's anything else, or if anything else does it other than God himself, it's not of God. God will not allow man to glory in his works. And the Southern Baptists glory in their works. We are the second biggest denomination. We're the biggest Protestant denomination. Or the whatever. They usually don't call themselves Protestants, I don't think. But in the country. So, that's not a good thing with God. Are you faithful to him? The answer is no. Southern Baptists are carnal. The fact that they promoted, they were promoting Rick Warren in the Purpose Driven Life. And so were a lot of other denominations. I know here locally, back then, there was a time when Rick Warren's uh, book was still fairly new. And there was online uh, databases so you could find out what churches in your area had done the Purpose Driven Life 40 Days of Purpose program. And I looked it up in this, uh, for this area here, and I was astonished at some of the churches that had gone through the 40 days of purpose. I think two of them were large Nazarene churches, Nazarene holiness churches, churches that claim to, be seek to, to operate in the power of God, or used to. That was, I think, over a decade ago that I, I saw that information. No, that database doesn't exist online anymore. Anyway, and, and anybody that's, uh, if you've read Rick Warren's uh, The Purpose Driven Life, then you or The Purpose Driven Church, which preceded it, you know how incredibly carnal it is. It's absolutely, Rick Warren 
has no idea who God is. He does not personally know him. It's obvious from his material. But the Southern Baptists basically made a saint out of him. And they were promoting him among their churches. Of course, he is a Southern, Rick Warren's Southern Baptist. The very fact that the denomination would think that's a great thing proves how incredibly carnal the Southern Baptists are. I uh, hope a successful convention would be a convention that would dissolve the Southern Baptist Convention. Not going to happen. I hope that this convention is perhaps uh, such a disaster that some churches begin to think uh, maybe it's time that we cut our ties. Other churches are independent. If they can do it, why can't we? I hope any church out there that has any real Christians in it will take the opportunity to consider. I, I'm, this thing will come out as a disaster one way or another. Nothing good can come out of the Southern Baptist Convention, the, these meetings, because they're not of God. They're, they're, they're held in violation of the Word of God itself, and their purposes are contrary to that. They talk about preaching the gospel, but they don't even know what the gospel is. They don't believe in the power of God unto salvation. They don't know what it is. Because they're full of carnal people. They might believe that God exists, or say they believe in God exists, but they don't act like they believe that God exists, and God has spoken, and God has sent His Son. They live for the flesh. They don't live like they're citizens of the kingdom of God and not of the world. That's true of most Christians. And it's a temptation for all Christians to go with the flow. because it's more comfortable, at least for now. It would be good if a thing comes just, just, a, just blows up and then the churches say, eh, it's time to get out. God deliver your people from the hands of these rogues that run the, the uh, what do they call, the, the organs of the convention, or the, uh, they've got a particular word for it, the different things, the seminaries and universities and printers and uh, lobbyists and all that stuff. See, all that's outside the control of the churches. Then the convention scripts its own convention. So it determines the agenda and basically determines what's going to happen. That's the way these things work, just like political conventions. It's about the same level of spirituality as the Democratic Convention or the Republican Convention. Ugh. Well, it only lasts three days, I believe, where it's Sunday through Wednesday. Nothing good will happen there. because it's all flesh. Flesh controls it. And anybody that objects is going to be marched out the door. Like last time, they just marched them out. Of course, they canceled. Which was it, the 20 convention or the 21 convention they canceled because of the pandemic? Could do the whole thing online, but nah, we'll just reappoint ourselves. Do away with this thing. Be aware, um, one of the things on the agenda, although it's not openly on the agenda, is the, the problem that the Southern Baptists have of sexual abuse now. And there's pressure to turn the Southern Baptist Convention into a true denomination with denominational authority to regulate the local churches, which it doesn't have now say, which would be a takeover of Southern Baptist churches. If they can regulate the pastors and determine who can be a pastor and who can not be a pastor in a local church, then it's a full-fledged denomination 
with uh, something other than Christ as the head. And that's the direction the pressure's working toward. And right, you know how America is. If an issue, issue is hot button and it's got a lot of emotion behind it, people will go with the emotions rather than think about this. There's a lot of pressure out there on the web uh, about uh, sexual abuse and everything else and victims and everything. This is a, trying to use emotions to do something stupid. If the local church is not, these are local church issues. The local church is responsible for disciplining its members. That's what the Bible teaches. Denominations are ungodly and wicked creations of the flesh. And if the local church doesn't, the, 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 the way you become a Southern Baptist is you send them money. They want to become, because there's, there's always a pressure, fallen human beings always want to, to go big and centralized. Big government. They trust in America. Trust in government. We just need more government, another layer of government, more laws, more rules, more authorities, more programs. That's the Southern Baptists. Well, they're going to swallow the big one, perhaps. Well, God's going to show them for what they are. We need the, all that dirty laundry to be thrown out there. And then maybe people realize this is not of God. We need to have a church that follows Christ. It's better to, if your local church will not follow Christ, you're a lot better leaving that and finding some other people that want to follow Christ. Even if it's only meeting in your living room, that is a church where two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. For his will, that's the church. You're far better without that, this whole idea of, of having to have an incorporated thing and a building. This is all ungodliness. And that stuff takes over. It always corrupts the church to one degree or another. When you look at the church through the scriptures, what the church is called to be, and how the church is described. And you look at the church in this world, in America, you'll find out they're not the same thing. There's Christians in those churches, born-again Christians, here and there. But the Scripture calls us to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Then I will receive you as sons and daughters. We need to separate ourselves from ungodliness, particularly ungodliness in the church. Leave the dead to bury the dead. If they will not hear the gospel, if they will not follow Christ, leave them alone. That's the admonition of Scripture. You cannot say, you know, there's, the old, there's an old American proverb, if it's, assuming it's American. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So it is. You can preach the gospel to a person. The real gospel, not the gospel of Rick Warren, not the gospel of Billy Graham even. You can't make the horse drink. Salvation is of the Lord. And it's God's work in you that makes you a Christian, not some program of man. God will not save people through man-made programs because they're not his program. You'll create church members and buildings that people call churches, but you will not build the church of Jesus Christ. Christ must build the church of Jesus Christ. His gospel, the gospel of salvation by grace, through faith in Christ alone.